about it? Yeah, yeah, send that. Send that, send that to my phone. Hold on. Dylan. Yo, what's going to do, man? Yeah, send yeah, send that. I'm, I'm doing something right now, kid. Send that to my phone. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, send that to my phone now, Dylan. Hurry up so I can do that. I am. Dylan, send it to phone. I am. I'm doing it as fast as I can. I need that picture, Bob. Do you know my number? I got it right there. Okay, Tony send it. Send it. I don't hear no beeping. It's sent. Yeah, kid. How are you? Good. Where are you guys headed? I don't have a clue. Ashland, <laughs> Kentucky. Okay. Oh, nice, 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 nice. Uh, Tony, you got some time to chat? Yeah, a little bit. Cool. Um, first of all, I want to thank you for last night. I appreciate all the advice and everything. I'm going to help. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, sir. Yeah. Um, so, uh, you know, I was uh, doing a lot of research this morning and last night. And, uh, you know, you've had a long and historic career. You've done a lot of great things in pro wrestling. And uh, as, as we talked about, as we alluded to in the promo that I did last night, I was a big fan growing up of Saba Simba, even though it was right. a short-lived character of yours. Uh, my question to you is, how was the Saba Simba idea pitched to you back in 1990 when you came back to the WWF? How was it game to me? Yeah. Well, if they just called me in and somebody to costume told me to get dressed and that was it. Yeah. Uh, was it something that you were a fan of? Of Saba Simba? Yeah. Did you enjoy doing the character? Oh, yes, yes. I enjoy it very much. Very, uh, very much. Now, one thing that I remember from when you debuted yeah. on right. WBF television was... Roddy Piper on commentary putting over that you were in fact Tony Atlas. Uh, I don't know if you recall this at all, but he just said, you can't fool me. That's Tony Atlas. Now, was that something that Piper was supposed to do and acknowledge the fact that you were previously Tony Atlas? Or uh, was that just something that Piper did on the fly? Uh, no, no. Uh, what it was, you see, Vince, Vince was just trying to jerk me around there. You yeah, know, that that just Vince, you know. Pipe would do what Vince tell him to do, you know. So, so he would just jerk me around on that deal. Yeah, because I don't know what the commentators said, because they rehearsed what the. Yeah, my, that's a good point. Yeah, Vince would just jerk me around on that deal, because they they uh, Vince always been like that. He would he would he did they never tell me nothing. See, with the, with the WWE and with, not just WWE, with uh, independent promotion, everybody I work for, everything is need to know basis. Sure. Like, no, Coach Sam, I don't know nothing until I get there. They don't tell you nothing. It's not like the olden days where the, the, where the promoters give you all the information you need and make sure you're well informed. Most of the time, I don't get no information from Vince or most of the people I work for until I get I, I, I don't because everybody's tight lip about everything. So no, when they when he said that or whatever Vince did, I don't know about it until it happens. That makes sense. Now, uh, yeah. so and, uh, and you know that you've been on the independent, to be independent the same way. A guy would call you up and say, "Hey, I got you a book," and I said, "Yeah, where I'm going? You gonna go to Virginia? Okay. Are you available? Yes. Click. Right. And that's it." Yeah, it's not easy on the independents, I'll tell you that. But it, it sounds well, like it, well, there's one guy that I always say is the best in the that I ever worked for. His name is Eric Sims. Okay. When you talk to yeah, when you talk to Eric Sims, after you get talked to him, he send you all the information before you leave the house. You you got a itinerary, you know where you're going, you know what you're gonna do, you know who you gotta talk to, you know what time to be there, you know what time to leave, you got your air fryer, you got all the information on your hotel. You got everything. But Eric Sims, he do things the same way Vince McMahon does it. When you work for Vince, you stay in a hotel, you wake up in the morning, he stick the artillery for that day underneath your door. So you wake up in the morning and, and you walk to your door 
everything you need to do that day, what time you need to be there, what what you need to do, everything is right right there. But most guys, they don't think about that. They just worry about getting the date. And once they get the date, they get the confirm. You'll be lucky if you hear from this guy before you get on the airplane. Right. I work for one promoter. I don't even get my flight until the night before. Oh, wow. Oh, yeah. That, yeah. That, I mean, that doesn't shock me, though, because uh, some some independent promoters are uh, a, a little shady, to say the least, Tony. Well, I wouldn't say shady. It's just they just don't know how to 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 it. They, they lack it on information. Sure. Yeah. So you constantly have to ask questions. What is this? What is that? What? 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 And that that just I, I they not that they don't want to put the time into doing it. See what happened was the phone. That's where the problem came in at. Mm-hmm. Everybody texts and, and, and everything, and they and they try to do five or six things all at once. So once they call you and confirm the date, they figure they're done with you. Sure. Then they get on the phone doing something else. If you ever notice people at today's time, you be very, very lucky if you see anybody go 10 minutes before they grab their phone. They're right. always on it. So yeah. by the, the, yeah, as soon as they get through talking to you, all of a sudden they go on the phone and they involved in something else. You are no longer on their mind. They, they, they think about something else now. They already did that, so then they move on. So it makes it hard for talent to get in the information. So when I do interviews and people ask me, because I don't know what the hell to tell you. <laughs> well, <laughs> the promoter ain't told me. Right, I right. Can't tell you what I, don't, I can't tell you what I don't know. Sure. Uh, when, you know, I, when I think about your couple runs with Vince uh, Jr., I think about the fact that you had the opportunity to work for not only Vince Jr., but also Vince Sr. What would you say the differences between Vince Jr. and Vince Sr. was in terms of working for them? Vince Sr. was a man. Vince Sr. was a man. See, a man would tell you to your face what he want, what he think, what he want, mono or mono. And Vince Jr. could never tell you to your face what he think or what he want. Mm. Yeah, yeah, he don't he, he don't have the kahunas to face you face to face. So your relationship with uh in fact Vince... in fact Stephanie Stephanie McMahon got bigger balls than than her father. Oh wow. Well how how how's your relationship with Steph over the years? I don't know her that well too. Back in it, uh, but I but I know she's a very strong will, very you know, you know, strong will woman. Sure. Uh, now I I know that you are definitely old school, but do you keep up with the current product at all? No. It's hard to watch at times. Would you say? I just no, it's not that. I just don't have the time. I got gotcha. you. Have you yeah, seen? I, I don't, yeah. I, I don't have time to just sit around and watch a three-hour wrestling show. Right. No, I understand that. Uh, I don't know if you heard, but now that the WWE is now having their network on Peacock, a lot of the people from Peacock are going back and editing old racist segments or uh, segments that involve like stereotypes and pro wrestling. Now, uh, in terms of like going back and editing old content like that, where do you stand? Do you think it's something that should be done or do you think that it should be something that's left in the product and could be maybe a, a teachable well, well, moment well, to the well, younger? Well, well, once again, kid, you know something I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> well, what, it's hard for me to speak on something I don't know nothing about. Well, I, I get that, but but so as I'm telling you this though, like, do you think that it's something that they should do? Should they cut out old content like that? I I, 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 I still I still can't comment on something until I see it myself. Sure, sure, sure. I get that one. I mean, I, I mean, you just that brought, you just told me about this. I can't all of a sudden give you a comment on something I just heard about two seconds ago. I I get. I got you. I understand that completely, Tony. And then and then you were very brief on what you told me. <laughs> <laughs> Tony, I apologize. You gotta do like Earl Sim. Give me a, give me a, 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 a artillery on what's going on. What are they doing now, again? 
they're they're editing the content on the uh, on Peacock. Like they're going back and like segments that can be considered racist, like when DX parodied Nation of Domination, they edited that out of Monday Night Raw and stuff like that. So I was just thinking like, you know, is that something that we think that they should be doing, not only from wrestling, but old television shows in general, like, or is that something that could be a teachable moment to keep it in front of? Yes. Huh. Yeah. This first I heard of it. Yeah, I I know. Oh, so that means they ain't gonna show Saba Simon no more, huh? <laughs> <laughs> that, so I'm that, getting cut out of something you're telling me. Once again, I'm fired, and I don't even know I'm fired. That might be the case. How I don't the hell know, did that I'm sorry, they man. Me be black. I'm racing. Oh, yeah. I'm sorry. I, I I hate to break it to you, Tony. They cut out no more Saba Simon. Very unfortunate. Well, you know, something that you do know a lot about is your time teaming with the soul man, Rocky Johnson. You guys were the soul patrol. You guys were the first African-American WWF champion tag team champions, which is a huge accomplishment. Now, when that was, when the idea of you guys winning the tag team titles was laid out to you, was that something that you both realized was going to be let very me historic? Ask you something, kid. I told somebody else this is true. Sure. I'll give you another survey to do. Okay. How many times do the, when after me and Rocket won the belt? Yeah. After we won the belt, right? Yep. How many times did we team up after that? I don't think it was too long because you guys won in what? The end of 83? Uh, Is that right? No, no, I said after we won the belt, right? Yeah. How many times the Amir Rocket teamed up, wrestled as a team, after we won the title. I'm not sure. Now, we, now, now we world champion, right? Yes. How many matches you think me and Rocket had as as tag champions all together? How many matches have you seen of me and Rocket as a team? How many matches have you seen? Mm, I, I can't recall one, to be honest. Because you only saw one. Ah, that makes sense. Nobody ever think about that. Very you true. cannot find a match of me and Rocket Johnson. There's only two matches you can find of me and Rocket Johnson. Why is that? Two. Well, I don't know. I, I wasn't in charge. I, I teamed up with Rocket three times. Yeah. Together. We only had three matches where we was a team. Three. In eight months. That's weird. It, it would nobody ever notice. Hmm. It just seemed like we teamed we, up with we won the belt. Yeah. We did one match in Toronto as a tag team, and we teamed up when we lost the belt. But you, you if you search all over, you're only gonna find two matches of me and Rocket Johnson as a team. When we won the belt, but we lost the belt. Why why do you think that was that you guys only had a limited amount of matches during that time period? Brother, that's something you got to ask Vince. What was what, what was it like in that initial match, winning the belts from the Wild Samoans? Do, do you have any, any uh, awesome memories from that night? No, not really, because they didn't do nothing with it. True. See, when you do something, okay, let's say you go out and you buy a new car, right? Yeah. But you never get to drive it. Mm. And then somebody say, how you like your new car? <laughs> How in the hell would you, what, what, you know, how in the hell are you you gonna answer that question? You, right. They, they, right. they give you the car, but then they take the keys away. Mm. Well, you can never drive it. That would not be fun. Exactly. So that's why being rocking, we don't even really talk about the title because what good was it? They gave us something that they gave us a new car that we couldn't drive. What are Nobody your... ever noticed every time they talk about being rocket, don't talk about one match, right? Yes, very true. Right, because that's the only match they ever seen. For you the personally, match when we, won, when we won the belt and when we lost the belt. That was it. Yes. For for you, I, you should, I, I tell him I did. Go on the computer. I asked my friend here, see how many matches you can find a rocket. Ask the computer how many 
matches the Tony Adams. My buddy's looking it up right now. You're not going to find any. Because we never teamed up after we won the belt. We won the belt uh, that night, and it separated us the next day. <laughs> you answer that one, kid. That, that's bad booking to me. No, no, I wouldn't say it was bad booking, but that's just how, how it was for me and Rocky. Yeah. And I'll tell you something else you never noticed either. What's that? After Rocky lost the belt, did you see him anymore? No, sir. Nobody noticed. That's unfortunate because you guys were two incredible talents. When when Rocket, when me and Rocket dropped the title, Rocket Johnson never worked again. Hmm. That that last match was Rocket Johnson's last match. That's unfortunate. That's the, that how the business was in them days, kid. What for you when you look back at your career? What would you say uh, was was the highlight for you? What was your favorite matches? When I wrestle Harley Race, I found four matches so far. Not no, <laughs> but no, but that was Andre too. Oh, just okay. me and Rocky. Just, right. just me and Rocky. Three. Three. It was uh, that's right. It was y'all against Adrian Adonis, uh, Jesse Ventura. Definitely, yep. Yeah. Uh, yeah. See. <laughs> uh, it's up on here. Three. Uh, the six man. See, that's a six man. Not me and Rocky. Uh, y'all against Dr. Noodle and uh, Bob Bradley. And uh, y'all against uh, David Schultz and Greg Valentine. That was it. And then y'all said y'all wrestled Bob Smullen. So no, we only wrestled him one time. Right, but I didn't put name that. Never, they never got a rematch. Right. They never, they never noticed that they did. Uh-huh. Well, yeah, that- but that's just how to be. It changed a lot now, uh, opportunity now than what they did then. But you know, you, you know, we just was not meant to be there. Sure. Not at that time. We're talking the eighties, the early eighties. You understand that? See, the eighties. What a lot of people don't realize is ten years after desegregation. Mm-hmm. See, we America desegregate in the in the early seventies. So, so me and Rocky, we were we was only ten years into desegregation. You know what that is, right? Yes, absolutely. Well, did, right, did you, right. do, do you find that during that time period in the 80s, you were still fe- experiencing a lot of racism as an African-American in the business? I wouldn't say it was racism. It was more of the pecking order. You had a certain spot where you could go and then you get cut off. Yeah. It wasn't just for african America. It was for females. Uh, you know, it was a pecking order. Sure. You know, you don't belong. You don't belong in that spot. You belong here, but not here. You know, they had a certain uh, a limitation of how far you could go uh, in the uh, uh, in the wrestling business uh, uh, with uh, certain people. And it was mainly due to the way that they only had that one style yeah. of guy. Yeah. in the territory because they'd have five or six matches. And then, and then and there was only room for one minority at the top. Sure. So like if you have a Thunderbolt Patterson to be your top black guy, couldn't no other black guy be on top? Yeah. Or what if you it? have Bruno Sammartino as your champion, they could not use or push another Italian. Right. Well, it was the same way with or like... You uh, Ricky, well, yeah, just... like with Rick and Steamboat. Yeah, with Rick and Steamboat was on top in WCW, another Hawaiian could not come in and become a main eventer. He had to be a jobber, but he could not be a top wrestler. Yeah. They already had a top Hawaiian wrestler. Well, I... wasn't just for blacks. And black... Yeah, same thing with Polish people. Albert Puskin was a top Polish wrestler. So if you was not, uh, if you was Polish, you're, you're going to be a jobber. No matter how good you was. Yeah. How much you team with the guy. You know? Yeah, for uh, sure. Uh, right, right. At a certain at a certain time. Yeah. So, uh, you what, know, it was a peck. Yeah, it wasn't racism, it was just a pecking order. 
I got gotcha. you. Now, yeah. you, you mentioned Harley Race, and I think the younger generation really doesn't appreciate or understand what a man's man Harley was and what an incredible worker he was. Uh, what are your memories of Harley and working with him? I, he was he the best I've ever seen. One of the best I've ever seen in the ring. Because Harley could work anybody's style. See, if you work with Ric Flair, you have to adjust the way Ric Flair wrestled. If you work with Abdullah the Butcher, you have to work the way Abdullah worked. But Harley would work your style. Right. Harley was a, he was not what you call repetitions. He was uh, adjustable. See, most wrestlers got a certain way of working. And they work within that frame. But with Harley Race, he could work in any frame. He could work with a 230-pound guy and have a great match. He could wrestle, work with a 320-pound guy and have a great match. He knew how to adjust with whoever he worked with. So he could have a great match no matter no matter who, who he was. He could wrestle a woman and have just a greater match he can wrestle against Ric Flair. He just, he just had that type of talent. The only other guy I knew that was like that was uh, 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 that I worked with with, with, with Dory Funk uh, uh, Jr. He was like that too. He could adjust to uh, uh, to anybody way of working. He never had no one way of doing things. Absolutely, no. That those those two are legends. Like if for you sure. watch Rick Flair, yeah, you watch Rick Flair. You know, a lot of his matches was uh, repetition. A lot of Hogan matches was uh, repetition. They did pretty much the same thing pretty much all the time, you know. But with Harley Race, he never had the same match twice. Right. Yeah. Uh, Ric Flair often gets that. Uh, label as either you you think he's the greatest of all time or you think that he just did the same things over and over. Like I think he was one. Of, I think he was one of the biggest draw that this business ever seen. I would say he was a bigger draw than Huck Hogan because he didn't have the hype and the cable television and all the stuff that Hogan had to help assist him. Hard, uh, uh, Flair had to do it on his own. He had no assistance from TV. And he had to make his own way. So I would say, yes, Flair was one of the greatest wrestlers of all time. He was bigger than Hulk Hogan simply for the fact that he didn't have all the uh, the assistance. There was no assistance to put Flair to where he was at. Sure. And, you know. I mean, you uh, got to start thinking about Flair started in the 70s where you only had three stations. <laughs> right. Right. Absolutely. And, and also. There was only three. There was no, there was no internet. None of that stuff. No. Hogan came along. Time it is everything. Hogan came along at the right time when they, they have cable television, a lot of cable television, HBO, they had talk shows, uh, uh, opportunity to get into movies. And it was just more opportunity for, uh, more opportunity for Hogan to become a big star than, than what Ric Flair or people of that era had. So like one of the, the most powerful men's I've ever wrestled, nobody know him that well. They don't even talk about it. And that was Larry the Axe Hennon. Yes. Incredible individual, incredible, incredible. But he came along during a time where they didn't have cable TV and wrestling was not a big thing. It was not one of the major sports in uh, uh, to, to watch at that time. So, yeah, time it is everything. It's like a Bruno Sammartino. He was a great wrestler, but how many people talk about Bruno now? He came along during a time where nobody, if you didn't live on the East Coast, you didn't know Bruno. If you live in Virginia, you know who the hell Bruno San Martino was. Because television was syndicated back then. That's why you could wrestle in one territory back then. If you come and be a babyface, go to another territory and be a heel. Yeah. No, you know, you... nobody saw nobody saw nothing that happened in New York. The only way that people knew what was going on back then was through the magazine. Right. That was our main, yeah, the wrestling magazine was the main uh, 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 promotion for wrestling back then. So if you didn't buy a wrestling magazine, you didn't know nothing about wrestling. Right. Yeah. You know, you mentioned Larry the Axe, and I think a lot of people forget how incredible he was as well. But obviously from my generation. Or John, or John Leather Jonathan. I, who, I don't. Was, that's where I got my finishing move from. Really? Yeah, he's a press now. He was incredibly strong, incredibly strong. And he, he was very agile, too. He did drop kicks and everything. He was like six, 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 six seven. John Leothard Jonathan was his name. Wow, I, I, I'll i have to look him up. I don't know much about him. Yeah, they had a lot of guys like that. You know, like Peter Maville, the rock grandfather. How many people saw Peter Maville wrestling? 
I, I haven't seen a lot of his matches, but I, I know yeah. his story. A lot of people talk about Boba Brazil. How many matches have you seen of Boba Brazil? Not too many. He used to come in. I see I'm from Cleveland, so he used to come into the ter- Cleveland territory yeah, in yeah, the 80s see? a lot. So, but so the time, the time, yeah, time was, was totally different. Eh? It was hard for a wrestler to get popular like like a Elvis Presley or or, or somebody of, of, of that of that name. You know, because the, the three major sports at that time during the, the 60s and 70s, you know, was football, baseball, and basketball. And wrestling, they wouldn't even put wrestling uh, in the newspaper unless you got in trouble. Don't be a wrestler get get in the coverage. You got to go get in trouble. That's unfortunate. But, well, no, that was the time. That was the time. Nothing was unfortunate. Because luckily we got the internet. A lot of these guys are remembered. They got pictures and stuff on these guys. But if you ever do a wrestling program, every time I talk to somebody, they always start with the 80s. Yeah. They never talk past 1980. It was like there was no professional wrestling in America before 1980. There was no wrestling in America. If you listen to commentators, yeah, they, well, always I... start in the, they always start in the late 80s. They start with the Hulk Hogan era. So anything that happened before Hulk Hogan don't get talked about. That's when every, every everybody talked to me, every interview I ever talked on, they start in the late 80s and early 90s. So you wasn't around in the early 90s you gonna be forgotten about, right? If you wrestle in the seventies and eighties, nobody go, nobody talks about you. You have to be in the nineties to be talked about. But people don't know that there was wrestling before nineteen ninety. They don't know that because nobody ever talk about it. Right. Well, that I mean, I would imagine that's because of how the things changed with the rock and wrestling boom in nineteen eighty five, and you, well, you know, no, what ended up happening with Vince McMahon took over. He tried to bury everything that happened before him in order to develop his new talent. Sure. Yeah, he tried to bury everything that happened. Like with everybody that, that was created by his father, like Captain Lou Albano. You know that when Albano left the WWF, they never mentioned his name again. Like it was never there. Right. When Bruno left, they never talked about Bruno on there, about nothing. You don't hear, you know, even now you never hear Bruno Sammartino name mentioned. You don't hear Superstar Billy Graham name mentioned. You don't hear Bob Orton Sr. name mentioned. You don't hear about Larry the Axe Henry, Ox Baker. You don't hear none of these guys name mentioned. Right. Well, do you think that's why? It was like the devil was here on earth. When Vince brought you back in 1990, do you think he changed your name because he he just you weren't a creation of Vince McMahon? Tony Atlas wasn't your creation. Is that why? Exactly. Yeah. They try to bury everything that was before them. What What did you think about your run in 2008 with Mark Henry? Were you a fan of Horrible. that? Didn't like Horrible. it. What? Well, would you like being humiliated on TV every day? No, I would. I would not enjoy that. Okay, all right. You watch the matches, and then you tell me. You watch, but you watch me with Mark Henry, and then you tell me how would you like that every week? Hey, but I got a paycheck. That's that's what I kept looking at. I'm getting paid. When, I'm when getting we, paid when, to be abused. I've been abused. I've been abused for free. So he he paid me to abuse me. So I, I don't have too many complaints. When they pitched- yeah, and in fact, I used to pay women to abuse me. So. You know, I, I've heard things about that on the internet. Right? Uh, yeah, about me having sex with baboons. <laughs> I, I, well, I didn't hear about that. You didn't see me with that baboon? No. Oh, I love to monkey around, brother. Okay, <laughs> all right. I mean, I, yeah. I, I, I know- but, the, I, but, uh, I, but, 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 but I repent, I don't do that no more. Well, I, I do know of the legend it's of- It's parakeets now. Uh, okay. I, I, I know have a, I have a pecking good time. You are ridiculous, sir. <laughs> you gotta be. That's the only way to survive in this it. business. Hey, don't knock until you try. I hear you. Well, well, listen. If if I were to say have a foot fetish or a shoe fetish, is there a particular shoe or foot that I should aim for? Big foot, little foot. What am I looking at here? Well, it depends on what you like. Everybody's different. Sure. 
It's like Skinsky, Skinsky, he likes sucking toes, see? <laughs> Everybody likes sucking on something. What sure. you like sucking? Uh, see, we all like to suck something. It depends on the time of day, Tony. Oh, yeah. Like, like, well, you, you, you just unfortunate that you didn't know Patterson. He would have he broke you into sucking. Oh, boy. This is going down a weird path. <laughs> Well, you want to talk to a wrestler, did you? Yeah. Well, yeah. I you mean, I, listen. You didn't thought you were calling a banker when you called me up. Is no, it? I knew what I was getting myself into. Yeah. Uh, it grease up there, son. Well, well, well Tony, where, where does where does the foot fetish come from? Like, where, where does that start for you? How do you find out? Like, I'm just in the feet. Brother, all the way they are. Nobody know why. Yeah, you had to find out why. In ten years, ten thousand dollars later, they still don't know why they're so freaking weird. We just everybody just different. That would make the world up. Sure, we all different. You know, think about this. Then I got to go because we at the mall. Think about this. Since the beginning of time, there never been anybody born with the same fingerprint or DNA. Since the beginning of time. True. That's how come law enforcement is able to catch you by your DNA because nobody got the same DNA. That's why they can catch you by your fingerprint because nobody got the same fingerprint. When that boils down to you're not going to find two people with the same likes or the same personality. I may like fried chicken. You may like it with barbecue sauce. Another guy like it with salt and pepper. Another guy like it with salt and vinegar. But it's, it's different as I. And that's why in the Bible say, judge not, yet ye be judged. Very true. You you, 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 make, a, you make a great point, Tony. Not everyone has I the same thing. Thank you for calling. Thank you for talking with me, Tony. I appreciate your time. Have a good one. Happy 4th, brother. Happy 4th. All right. Thank you, brother. Later. All right.